We can cry. We can bleed. We can fuck. Welcome to Two Guys and Some Horror. Today, we're talking about 1995's gem of a horror movie, Screamers. Curtis, how you doing today? I'm not so sure I want to call this a gym yet, but I'm doing all right. Today is St. Patrick's Day, so I'm, I'm doing well. I've been drinking for a while now. <laughs> good. Is that good to hear? I don't know. Uh, I'm Clark, by the way. Uh, Curtis is my co-host here. The two of us, we are two guys in some horror. We discuss horror movies, and tonight we are talking about the 1995 horror movie, Screamers, uh, which is a film about robots who uh, decide to kind of go rogue and murder everyone in sight uh, as if they are somehow now self-aware. Curtis, what did you? Uh, what, what are your feelings towards this movie? What What's going on in your head right now, in your heart, your heart of hearts? Well, so as as discussed previously, I'm not a big fan of this movie. I'm not like completely against it. This isn't the worst movie I've ever seen in my life, but it's just very rip off. I don't know. I I don't yes. want to say rip off, but it it doesn't feel original in anything it does. Um. The acting to me was like average. There's really only one person in this movie who I felt can actually act. And then just to top it off, the story just feels so similar to something else I've seen that I love. And I know that that's also the person that this movie's, the person who wrote that, this movie's based off that writing as well. Like that's what's really frustrating to me is that I just, I feel like they beat this thing to the ground and in fact made it less enjoyable to me personally i don't um what what do you think they kind of copied so the writer let's let's just run through the little bit of information that i scrounged up about the film streamers 1995 as said by clark already the director was christian dugoy who also went on to do scanner 2 and scanners 3 um then the writer is philip k dick who wrote the short story, um, which is what this is based off of, Second Variety. But he's also the writer um, for Blade Runner. And uh, what it's really the book that that's based off of, which is Do Sheep's Dream Electric Something Rather or whatever. Um, also the book that spun off the movie Minority Report, which is called Minority Report, I believe. Total Recall and A Scanner Darkly. So... That's the main writer. That's what everything this movie has is based off of. Okay. But then you have Dan O'Bannon and Miguel Tejada Flores, who wrote the screenplay. They've done other films, which is amazing. Like the credits here are insane for what we get in 1995 because these gentlemen wrote Alien, Aliens, Dark Star, and The Return of the Living Dead, as well as Revenge of the Nerds, The Lion King, and Frankenstein's Army. So there's like tons of credit and really solid work here. Um, like, I just love it. But this movie feels like a complete knockoff or a complete second-rate version of Blade Runner. You have very similar stories, very similar concepts, uh, and a, a very similar ending to the film. I'll take your word on that. I still have never seen Blade Runner. I've watched like the first 15 minutes, and I just... I can't power through it. It's just too dry for me. I totally forgot. We've had this conversation before, actually. Where yeah, I know. So this this didn't remind me of Blade Runner at all because yeah. Blade Runner is very, very slow going, very conversational. Just not a whole lot happens. And when it does, it's over pretty quickly um, from what I saw. And just, I don't know, man. I... Wait, was that your... You were, you were saying that's what Blade Runner was to you? I've never gotten through it i i haven't yeah. been able to my attention span is just not made for it i but this movie was uh it, they do a very good job of kind of the exposition i kind of feel like you're you're very much attached to what's going on you may not understand i don't understand i still don't really understand what they were fighting against it was kind of mining but beyond that i i, I mean really they were they're fighting against themselves I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, that's it. To me, it was you had greedy, economical powerhouses, a bunch of rich guys running Earth. And then you had a bunch of like military slash um, hard working folks. Are revolting. And yeah. It's essentially a union strike. 
and that became a war. Um, and it's not really a war. It's more of a, hey, treat us right. And then they just kind of got in a battle and the, the rebels are doing just fine. But they're like, yeah, Earth's not coming. And it's mentioned that people from Earth aren't going to come visit them. I feel like they, they displayed the message fairly well. It's just I don't feel like this movie has aged at all. You can tell kind of the costumes with the uh, the way the characters are dressed, them using like Discmans and things like that. The the budget it's was hard. so big for such a like a movie to not age well seems crazy to me. But more money doesn't always I mean just, better, I guess. I don't think they took that into consideration, especially not back in the nineties. What it, what it felt like they were trying to make was like something like Starship Troopers. Mm -hmm. That was more of a kind of a thriller slash movie that kind of made you think, and they just didn't do a great job of that. Like the whole. Like we'll we'll talk about it in a bit here, but like the scene with the child and and all that, it, it's kind of creepy. I would, I feel. So we we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I feel like the trick. And for those of us, those of you who are listening to us in this podcast, I there the trailer when I first watched it, I feel like it kind of spoils the ending of the movie. Uh, before we even get to that point because there's a point in the trailer where it shows a scream and i was like oh they just they just gave away who the screamers are yep and well it, it's not 100 percent exact but you could figure it out it, if you pay attention uh, it, it it gave it away to me because i was yeah. like oh this person's gonna be yeah so a little behind the curtain screamer. for the listeners as well is you know like clark and i'll send trailers to each other on movies that we either find that look interesting or something that we might be thinking about doing as an episode. And this was probably two months ago when you and I started planning out this space month or this kind of, um, you know, science fiction month kind of feel for horror. Right, and we wanted a, a bad flick. We wanted yeah. something that wasn't, wasn't going to be fun to watch. And this is what we kind of landed on. And this movie was actually kind of a pain in the butt to watch. Like, it's not available on any streaming services beyond actually paying for, like... Stars. I just rented it. I, just rented it. <laughs> I paid, like, four bucks on Amazon Prime. Yeah. It wasn't worth... It's on Amazon Prime if you have Stars. It's on Hulu if you have Stars. The problem is Stars has the contract, so it's really a pain in the butt. I think I As found... And this is me, because this is how I always find my movies. Pretty sure I found this one on some like really crappy copy of a YouTube channel. Someone like cut out 90, you know, it's only 92% of the screen. So it doesn't meet the YouTube rules to pull it down or whatever. Well, but, you, you know, you, it would have been worth it. Well, next time let's, we can cast movies like this. One of us can rent it. So this is kind of like behind the scenes, behind the man behind the curtain here, but we don't have to do that. Um, Anyhow, folks, I, this movie is so I'm going to give it my Clark's quick review for, for you for you here. But uh, it's the thing. This is the thing meets Terminator meets uh, Escape from New York. Meets Tremors meets Blade I, Runner meets Phantasm. <laughs> <laughs> like I could pull all those even, movies and I say even reference that because the at the very beginning, if you did not watch the trailer to this film, you would think that the these uh, screamers are like these little robots that burrow under the ground, similar to Tremors. And the I think the effects on that are were very well done, like very well done. And it it turns into Terminator as well as the thing is because you as the as the audience member at some point you're supposed to question every single character and whether or not they are the screamer except for the main guy who um getting the care the colonel's name or joe hendrickson played by it, peter weller yeah well he's he's one of the main guys in the uh in the base it's like him and some other oh you're talking about his buddy well, yeah, but they're they're pretty high up there, and he's like, "I'm gonna go talk. We're gonna end this war once and for all." And uh, anyhow, he did a great job. Peter Weller did a great job. Yeah. So there's Peter Weller, um, and then there's his. I, I think you're you're talking about the very end scene, right? Not the very end, but you so see him at the very beginning as well. The two of them are talking. Becker. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so Becker is his buddy. Everybody Roy Dupuis. Yeah. Yep. Roy Dupuis, or however you pronounce it. Dupuis. Dupuis. Um, is that him? No, I, I don't think that it's, was him. It's either him or Ross. <clears throat> I think Becker was the young guy. See, this is how, and, and this is not me trying to, uh, it's not Ross either. It's not that guy. This isn't me trying to be mean about the movie or anything. Like, the movie is watchable. This is the thing. Like, I, I watched the movie. I was pretty much following everything along the way. It just didn't make a lot of sense to me. There wasn't anything that really hooked me in. There was way too much, to me, dialogue and not even like good dialogue. It was just a bunch of exposition to help try and keep pushing you forward, which just, it, it just didn't make sense to me. Secretary Green, I believe, Bruce Boa. The person at the very end? Secret- no, that's so. the VR guy. Who was already dead guy. two years prior? So let's let's kill the story. You look up what you're talking about. Let's regardless, let's, it doesn't matter. Yeah, let's uh let's go through the story real quick, just to kind of give the listeners an idea of what's going on here, and then we'll just kind of talk through any of the points that we have written down or or uh, anything like that. Or if there's any point when I'm reading through the storyline here that you have something you want to talk about, let's. Uh, let's- like just but seriously though like this this was a good movie it it was like what i was trying my original point that i was trying to deliver like i know i'm not done with the review but we kind of got sidetracked there um it's this is terminator because of the uh and the thing because you have these robots who are now thinking for themselves and they're trying to kill off every single human and get off the they're trying to get off this planet to go to earth so they can uh i would assume take over it take it over and replace all of of human life or whatever for whatever reason they're trying to get on the spaceship but yes yeah so you and i are obviously not in agreement on what we would rate the movie but yeah we both found it enjoyable yeah um well i don't know yeah i don't know what i would rate this movie yeah like would i watch it again probably not I mean, I may with friends to try and dissect it. And that and that's the thing is like when I first watched Blade Runner, okay, years ago, I sat down, I, I watched it. I, I couldn't finish it. I didn't really understand what was happening in it. I didn't really care too much about it. It didn't seem that great to me. Um, and then I came back, I don't know, a couple of years later and I actually sat down and tried to watch it again. Um, and... I don't know, I fell in love with it that time watching it. I don't know what changed or what was really different. It's not like I got some some great understanding about what was happening, but I think I just, I don't know, I just fell in love with that story, that idea. Um, and I think it's really this writer um, who wrote, you know, wrote the story that this is based off, Philip Dick. I, I think I really like his writing because I look at all the books he's written and those are all books on on my Goodreads list, you know, things that I want to read eventually. So it's just, it's very interesting to see a director and a producer take hold of a story that you really like and do something different with it. It's, it's not that book. I understand that it's, you know, it's, it's taking from that idea and building something on top of it, which is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I like your quick review. I do agree with you. It has a very, very, very heavy, like Terminator robot feel. Um, it also has, I don't know, it just, I feel like it's got so many things mixed inside of it that you can really almost say it's like X and X is just put whatever you want in there as long as it has a sci-fi feel to it. Right. Well, I, it, a lot of things do break your immersion in the film too. Um, which dude, that Walkman cool. though was it, that drove me nuts. The disc man. <laughs> There's a disc man because it's in the 1990s. You're in space, and of course they're gonna have a discman, and the man has like the porno VR goggle thing too. <laughs> that that made me laugh so hard. <laughs> yeah, he's the, supposed to be like keeping guard, you know, and watching his own he's back, and porn. he's just watching porn with the kid next to him and our main character sitting there. Oh gosh. Yeah. What the hell are you doing? All yeah. right, <laughs> so let's crush this story real quick, so that way we can pick it apart a little bit. So, the year is 2078. Um, on a distant mining planet called Sirius 6b, the planet has been ravaged by a decade of war. Scientists um, created the perfect weapon. It's these blade-wielding, self-replicating race of killing devices that uh, everyone calls screamers, and they're designed for only one purpose, and that's to hunt down and destroy any enemy life forms that exist. But here's the problem. 
Man's greatest weapon has continued to change and evolve over time without any humans helping it, and now it's devised a new mission, which is just to kill all life, to obliterate well, everyone. Is that even mentioned at the beginning? Because they, they talk about them being intelligent and they learn, but the small ones, I feel, were just looking after or trying to find these miners. And we don't get to that point where like they, they start killing everyone. Or so, were they already killing them at the start? Because I'm a little confused here. So at the start, you have um, Peter Peter Welling's group um, of Alliance members. And they're uh, a single... Um, we're going to call them Nebs because I'm pretty sure that's which side. It's the Alliance versus the Nebs. Yeah, they're, they're, they're the Alliance, the guys who are there on the main base. Who yes. are kind of waiting and watching. And there's a messenger who kind of runs up. Correct. And one of them's about to snipe him. And he's like, something's weird. He's like, so what? Just shoot him. And she's like, I don't know. And then a screamer comes and kills the guy. Correct. So a little I'm baby, not... a little baby tremor looking thing comes up and kills the scout Neb. Now, when after he's dead, they noticed he had something in his hand. So they send or one of the other guys, it's Peter Welling's best buddy, goes out, a message. goes out and decides to get that from him. When he goes out there, if you notice, he's also being threatened by the sentient being, uh, the, the screamer. So these screamers aren't they don't pick a side. They're literally it looks like they're just attacking whatever's outside, right? You don't, don't know go after Weller because of his his wristband. No, that's not. So what I'm trying to tell you is the very beginning of the movie, the first ten minutes of the movie here, we see right. screamers attack both sides of the forces that are fighting each other. So they're not picking a side. So the they're screamers killing are killing who's anyone who's out there. Correct. It was anyone who was outside of the base. But yeah, that's you're probably right. You're probably right. But and remember, at some point with Weller's uh, little wristband, whatever that signal was, they mm -hmm. wouldn't attack him. Yeah, because the girl tagged him. I think is what it was. Yeah. So so basically, let's just keep walking down the storyline. So that yeah, that message it. gets grabbed. Um, they get back inside safely, and uh, Joe Hendrickson. So Joe's character, he's the he's the colonel. Yeah, Colonel Hendrickson. Um, Re, uh, listens to the message and basically it's a peace treaty or a peace meeting they want to have a peace meeting the nebs and the alliance you know a secretary uh it was some scientist wasn't it uh the guy who reached the guy who sent the message yeah is from the nebs yes yeah, so it was from the nebs but it was somebody it was secretary green who shows up later and says hey because okay so they sent this message back to earth which is where right. Secretary Green was. They said this guy was dead. Two years prior, correct. Yeah. Yes. So this is all VR, right? This is all messaging, which any alien robot type thing could could mimic. Well, um, even then, like they, uh, well, so right now at the audience, we have this conflicting message of this guy sent us this message, but he's dead. Yeah, but they don't know that yet. No, no, no. In the story. The, but but he, he gets told that he's dead. He says, hey, that guy's been dead for this many years. And they have a conversation about it. Yeah. Later on. Okay. Yep. Well, it's like right after this. Well, the kid hasn't shown up yet. That right. second kid. The, uh, what's his name? Jeffries? Yeah, the, the soldier who leaves with him. Jefferson, well, they, yeah. This this is just a bunch of exposition at this point for the film. Like this is where they're all talking and they're they're just kind of explaining what's going on with the war between the two factions, and they're going in and they're having food and there's a relationship set up with uh, Captain Joe, um, who's Peter Weller, mm -hmm. and then his right hand man, which I believe is Becker, mm -hmm. and then so so. So they get this message that there needs to be a peace treaty, but then they send that message to Earth and they also are, you know, looking into the message to see how legit it is. After they sent that message to Earth, Earth sent them back a message, which is the VR message that, you know, when Secretary Green comes in and says, hey, I implore you to go speak with them about the peace treaty because we've been working on it. Oh, by the way, there's this other planet that we found that has uh, berenium on it. And there's no radiation on that berenium, so we need to get this all solved because now we actually want to, you know, 
move the economic growth to that other planet, right? Right. So, so he's Mr. Policy and politics, I'd say. But yes, so at the end of the day, point. he was already dead. And that video was fake transmitted from most likely the screamers. They were setting them up. Because that pushes Joe to take Joe and Jefferson, who then shows up later on. How does Jefferson show up? Oh, well, the, we don't know the, this is the audience when we're watching this. Like, no. We don't understand that. So, like, Correct. I, so, I, I didn't dig into uh, to, like, all the, the nitty-gritty nitty -gritty stuff. So we just have this message, and this guy's like, what the fuck's going on? And then well, Jefferson goes, shows up on the plane or on the, the aircraft that had a giant – uh, radiation nuke, if I radiated nuke, if I remember right, that was heading for the planet that Secretary Green just told Joe and the other guy that they're trying to break into and get more beryllium out of. So this is where all the pieces start to kind of line up that something's not right. Because right. so well, go ahead. I get I kind of got the picture is like okay, so this is going on, and the captain like mentioned like yeah, they don't even care about us anymore this this we don't matter no matter what happens and he's like let's just end this war was kind of the uh the message that main character peter weller's character was kind of giving yeah and i think i i think that would have been the only goal um had jefferson not shown up with that nuke with right. that that nuke if that if that all hadn't happened and then, and then the screamers if you also watch the screamers suck that one dude who's inside down like they're trying to clean up that mess you you pick this up later. You wouldn't. I wouldn't think about anything weird happening at that moment. Yeah, no, I agree with you right there. That, yeah, that actually makes sense because he he gets pulled in and he just he's gone. Yeah. So listeners, I are we this is a really hard movie kind of to break down only because of all of it's it's almost a two hour film as well, um, and there are a lot of bits and pieces that are kind of moving that don't really you could say they don't really connect until you put everything together at the end of the movie and that's i think really when you have the best understanding of this entire film i would not know any of this i only watched this movie once and it was like a week and a half ago so like um if i, if I were to watch this and then read like a, a description of what was actually fucking or going on mm -hmm. in the first like first place then sure maybe but from from like the view, listener or the viewer's perspective we start out in the base there's a little bit of exposition given from our our side, like we we see, we hear this message from this this doctor who's whatever, and then we get the message from Earth, and there's a message mission for Joe to go talk to these people, and he's like, I'm gonna bring this this kid here who told me that this guy's been dead for two years with me. Yep. Well, and he can't take the and he can't take his right hand man because someone has to stay at the base and keep everybody safe. Well, I think in his he's mind, in charge. He's yeah. The guy in charge for all we know yeah he's basically number yeah. one on uh, star trek tng yeah i he is a captain I Riker. <laughs> put a pin put a pin on him our buddy there but so, yeah so there's all the what about the exposition though at the very beginning the scroll the wall of text when they when they tell you so they tell you why they're having the war they tell you that there's two sides and they tell you that the screamers are they don't tell you that like the screamers are in the middle. In fact, the way I, the, the information that I took, the way I took the information given was, the screamers were on the alliance's side and against the nebs. But obviously, that's incorrect. Right off the bat, you know, you so, see it go after the alliance guy. So I'm reading here, like, the, so the captain has the the wristband that prevents the screamers from attacking him, mm -hmm. and you need that to avoid getting attacked by the screamers. Well, so it alerts they, you, right? You, no, it looks like the scream. It prevents them from attacking him because remember when they were camping, they they did not jump for him. They went for everyone else. So when he was walking out and he was showing that that his junior around, like there was a screamer that jumped out. He he was not showing any hesitation whatsoever. He was not scared. He just he's like, oh my god, dude, it's just a fucking screamer. I'm pretty sure. But anyhow, like so they mm -hmm. go out on this mission, right? Let's kind of. With all the exposition, all the explanation, there's there's so much to kind of understand and know what's going on. Like at this point, if you're confused, it's completely fine. Like I definitely was. Mm -hmm. But all, for all I know is like they go out and they go to this kind of deserted place, right? Yeah, the old where the old city was that's been demolished by 
uh, bombing raids and all of the civilians that live there have been decimated. And they find a young child there mm -hmm. with a teddy bear. Why'd you put a pin on that? Yeah, the poor young girl. And she's living inside of what looks to be a dilapidated old building. Um, right. And she's very, I'd say she's very skittish. She's not sure of people coming up on her. And uh, you can tell she's very nervous that Joe and Jefferson are coming up to her. And then they, <laughs> it's just funny because he's like, he's got his gun kind of pointed at her the whole time, but not like fully pointed at her. And then he's just asking her such like normal questions like, where do you live? Is there anybody else around here? How do you eat or how do you survive? And then Jefferson jumps in and he's like, no, seriously, like, how do you eat? What do you eat? <laughs> how are you still here? Because there's no, I mean, you look around, there's nobody there. There's no signs of life. Like, I'm really curious at this point where she came from, right? I'm sure you were as well, Clark. Definitely. So we, we, we see them kind of take her in as part of the group. And the three of them continue on down their down their journey, but they stop for uh, the night. It looks like because it's getting very cold, um, and they decide to make a fire. And Jefferson asks, "Like, hey, are you sure a fire is a good choice? Because won't the screamers detect the fire?" And that's when he makes a comment to him, like, "As long as you have your wrist rocket thing on, the indicator." Um, you know, there's nothing really to worry about when it comes to the screamers. You'll be able to tell when they're coming because it goes off. It beeps and lets you know. Um, but the girl doesn't have one. So this is where I think the whole, as long as you're wearing one, you're safe thing. I'm not sure. I'm not hundred percent sure on that because they don't give her one and he doesn't offer to let her wear his, which I mean, me as an adult, like if I found a little girl and the only way was to keep her safe was to put one of those things on her and risk my own life. I'll totally hands down. I'm going to give her the, the protection, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, this is the moment where Jefferson makes the biggest mistake of his life, because he's laying there, and he's watching his VR porn with yep. his. What'd you say? Very loudly, by the way. A <laughs> walking disc, walk, like, dude, walk disc. When he puts on his headset trying to see what he was doing, it's it's he he like, so Peter Weller picks it up. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? He lifts it up, puts it on his face. It's like, holy shit, this is fucking loud. And takes it off. Yeah. And it's like, it reminds me of like the old Windows 95 or Windows 98 uh, music visualizer, you know, the black hole with the, yes. the trippy space stuff. And then it's literally nude women just kind of floating by in a virtual reality type thing. It's just some shitty 90s porn. That's built, all it is. <laughs> built into really cool 90s sunglasses, I might add with music you know the headphones are built into it. anyways not not to dive into a 90s nostalgia moment but that definitely screams 90s if if nothing else does in this movie the movie's 90s <laughs> interesting this movie didn't actually come out till 96 that's funny sorry i was that's just the correct time to, to be perfectly for the 90s just scrolling through here um and it only made uh about three million on opening weekend interesting oh, i wonder why yeah, I wonder why Peter Welling didn't do a good job of uh, marketing. This feels like a made-for-TV movie. So they, so they, it does. And I, I don't have anything to like. Like Jeepers say. Creepers or. Uh, no, the first Jeepers Creepers is a great no, film. Same. Oh They're my. both made-for-TV movies. Um. Oh my. Okay, I think we're. This is where. This is the moment where Clark and Curtis start to not agree on movies. In the podcast. This is going to be great. This is going to be great. Good. Guess what I'm making you watch next? Yep. Um, yep, it's happening. Well, Just, Justin it. Long. It's not, a, it's not a bad movie. Justin it's Long just, in a Tusk outfit. He's goofy. Um, <laughs> anyhow. Anyhow. Walrus the, outfit. The, Sorry. The to screamers correct show up. The kid kind of laughs at it. And he goes, ah, it looks like an animal. So at this point, this kid's fucking creeping the shit out of me, and I'm like, this kid need to go. Something's off. Yeah, something's off about this kid. They find it. It's just, it's just weird. As I'm watching this, I'm like, yeah, there's something going on here. And if people can be screamers from the from the trailer, then yeah, he's probably one of them. 
What happens, Curtis, when they're uh, they're walking towards the the NEB? What happens to the kid? So, this is this is where I'm not. I don't remember exactly how it broke down or whatever, but the kid, like her hand, turns into like some weird weapon thing, and then her face starts to stretch, and she starts to scream. She got shot. Oh, did she? She got shot because they're uh, they're walking at the base, and they're holding the kid's hands, and all of a sudden there's gunfire, um, and they we get to meet the people who are shooting them. There's the guy in glasses, and then we have the Snake Plissken ripoff, which is where the Escape from New York portion of the movie comes in, <laughs> and this is where it also is the thing because they're deciding to put in low budget Kurt Russell, and they shoot the the kid, the kid gets shot, and the kid is all of a sudden starting to transform. And they're like, holy shit, he's a screamer. And this is where we get introduced to three new characters. The two of them, one is the uh, the guy in glasses who's kind of like, get off my back, leave me alone. He says that quite a bit, get off my back. Mm-hmm. And then you have the Snake Plissken clone, clone, who I think his name is David. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's... Um... It's very interesting, to say the least, the way this all breaks down. Oh, man. Well, they they get the kid. And, um, you know, also, there's there, I want to mention that cigarettes are kind of considered a rarity in this film as well. They, they talk about it a few times, like, oh, there aren't that many cigarettes left. And it's touched on in several areas. Um but that's it's also where... one of the ways they heal right and uh due to the radiation it makes it hard to breathe and whatnot and it's there's these red cigarettes that they smoke to kind of cure themselves not necessarily cure but i guess i don't know what the right term would be but he hands jefferson the red cigarette and he's like how do you know if it's working and then joe colonel joe responds back with as long, well, you're not dead. So, like, clearly it's working if you're not dead, right? So he's like, I can't believe I have to smoke, you know, breathe this into my lungs just so I don't die from radiation poisoning kind of a thing, which is also interesting because that's those are cigarettes as well, but they're obviously a different kind of cigarette to keep them safe from the radiation. But, yeah, right. so we meet – I'm trying to remember who these Becker. two are. Becker. Um... And Ross? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so we so we meet them. Yeah, he's glasses boy. Chuck. Ace Becker. Chuck. Chuck is Joe's best friend from the main place. Becker and Ross are the two dudes they meet out in the right. Uh, open. Right. So he calls Chuck to let him about know about the new screamer that looks like a kid, mm-hmm. but Chuck can't hear him. Um. On his no, they keep. Band. Yeah, they keep having issues with. Uh, cell service. So you can't, you, they can't get back in touch with command. And Ace, it, so there's Ace and Becker. Ace is the uh, soldier who comes comes with. Uh, yeah, that's Jefferson. Right, and then Becker is uh, Snake Plissken with, ripoff. The Snake Plissken, and he's just a massive joke. But we meet Jessica, who's in charge, and she she just really likes her real scotch and she's tired of synthetic bullshit and, and she really loves cigarettes and she's a total badass and becker just says you're an attractive woman or uh not not becker uh the captain tells her that she's a very attractive woman right off the bat so we know there's sexual tension can i just say the dialogue in this movie i don't know if i've mentioned this but it's so bad like this is an hour this hour and forty eight minute movie. It could have been cut down easily to an hour and twenty eight if they would have just cut out a lot of this. Like even when uh, Joe and Jefferson are walking on their mission, yeah. and there's just so much forced exposition of like, well, this is why we do this now because these things happen. And it's like this guy doesn't even know Joe doesn't even know half of it, man. We just got introduced to Becker, Jessica, and Ross. And the three of them have more information on these screamers than Joe had in that 40-minute conversation. 
this would have been a better television series than a movie um if you're trying to build up this much background and exposition um, oh man it could be an awesome it still could be a great television it could, series it could it could be the issue is that they didn't really pace very well in this film uh they didn't really world build in a way that would make it easy to understand i i don't know this is something you kind of have to pay attention to and honestly this movie wasn't interesting enough for me to give it all of my attention like it, it's it's all right it's all right but so back when lady. hold on back at the fire he pulls the uh the chip tag off of that animal looking one yeah because he realizes that it actually looks different than the ones they're used to over by the alliance base that they see all the time i thought he said it was like a type two yeah so yeah. on the tag yeah on the tag it said type two or whatever so this is where so he they, starts to get the idea that there's more than one type of these not sure what so, that means yet but well, just so that way type two before it was the he's like this is type two i haven't seen one of these before um but there was anyhow like they find increasingly weirder ones as the movie progresses mm -hmm. like the kid had a type two as well as the animal i think because they pull his out too and they yeah anyhow they all of these characters now they're all trying to get out and the heroine is she's basically the badass leader i was trying to find um some more information here but i got nothing no, you're fine, man. Like, well, they they leave and they go. They're in the bunker, right? And they go. They find the uh, the command center, which is where these. I think was where they were originally created, the screamers. Yeah. So Jessica leads them to, basically, command center. I think they call it or whatever. Yeah. And yeah, it's supposed they... to be where all of the screamers are manufactured. That's where the screamer kangaroo shows up and kind of connects to the mainframe there. And it's about to leave, but Ross just gets up and starts shooting it. Instead of actually hitting the screamer, he shoots the computers. Shoots everything around them. <laughs> well, it attacks the noise. And the screamer's gone. And then they hear, can I go with you now? And uh, Joe's like, everybody has to leave. And they all check the computer system. And like there's like a bunch of kids, I think, at this point, right? Yeah, there's they just keep hearing, Can I go with you now? Can I go with you now? Can I go with you now? <laughs> like just crazy. Right. So they kind of take in like one of the ends of the viewer, maybe you know, oh, repeating something might make you a screamer, which they kind of push in a little bit here. Well, and Joe realizes because he, he stayed back because he didn't want to, like, lose information or whatever. He was in the computer, right? Looking at the different types that were on there. Because he saw the Type 2 and the layout of what a Type 2 looked like. And then it showed Type 4, which I thought Type 4 was the kid, but I could be wrong. Because he's like, well, what's a Type 3? So then when he gets back to right. Becker, Jessica, and Ross, he asks them, he goes, well, what the hell is a Type 3? And then um, Becker is – so this is where I, I for sure had a feeling about Becker, by the way, right here. Because if I, you I watch him – he's so, he's so fucking outrageously Snake Plissken that he's just bullshit. He's like sharpening a knife on his tongue. He's just being very theatrical about it. And I was like, this, this guy's either a really shitty actor – or they're going to do something with them, which gratefully they do. Well, and the tattoo is so garbage. weird. And the way he's sitting on this beam drinking whiskey, like nonchalantly, like, oh, nothing can hurt me. I, I, I mean, nothing can hurt me if I fall. Nobody, you know, life doesn't matter. Kind of a. I just thought it was outrageous. I was like, this movie's a fucking joke. I just, I had so, such a I weird like, feeling. I don't believe this at all. And then you have Ross and he's like just this big coward character. And just, I don't know, man. I, I don't really care. But they find the Type 3 and they explain to them, hey, this is a self-learning that looks like people. And this is the one I feel like that actually gained sentience and decided to take over. 
because they keep improving and they keep improving as uh, as screamers after this point yeah they definitely that model definitely uh is the one i'd say that helped turn the tides for the screamers and and because i mean well i think that was what i think that was the screamer that actually learned how to think for itself i think the type ones and the type twos were just robots yeah but then what i feel are the ones that revolted right but something had to build a type three right it was people people um yeah i think it was the i think it was the people in the command center the people who were creating them i think they made the type two and like they had seen type twos before um but then they're like hey i thought they discontinued the type three so they had intel prior to this that people were making this new type three I'm pretty sure it wasn't the screamers. Okay. I mean, I like, like I like the idea I that think someone our hubris created something that looked like a person and thought like a person and then kept growing and evolving their circuitry. Yeah, that's I mean, that's definitely a fear of us humans, right? The mm-hmm. the idea that something could kind of embed itself into our everyday life but be but not be what we think it is right and then after this when they when they find out that someone is is a screamer they they look at the chip there and it's like has unrecognizable symbols that aren't even in english Mm -hmm. it's like another language yeah Uh, well this is like before this like joe's like telling ace to not trust ross he's like he keeps repeating himself Get off my back. Yeah, stay like, stay off saying, my back. Get off my back. He keeps saying, get off my back. And he stabs him. Yeah, he throws, he throws his knife, knife at him. him. Yeah. And he's like, he's a screamer. And then the captain pulls the knife out. And he's like, this is blood. And Becker's like, well, I could have sworn he was, he, he was one of them. Well, I like his then, first, I like the first thing he says after Joe shows him. So Joe, Joe pulls it out and he's like, you said he was a screamer, but oh, there's blood on here or whatever, right? And then Becker instantly goes, oh, is there? Like, I don't know, man. There, ah, there's knowing what we've seen after this point and then talking and rehashing out a lot of the, the stuff that goes down. You're like, man, we should have known, man. He's just <laughs> a should... dick the whole, the whole process, Ace. Jefferson? Or are you talking about Snake Plissken wannabe? Snake Plissken. Okay. Oh, Joe. Sorry. Joe Becker. Um, but yeah, so they, so now it's just Becker. It's Joe Becker, Jessica, and Jefferson. Ross is now dead. Yeah. Um, and they're heading out. And they are going to head back to Alliance Base with the information they have now. Um, but they, But right. they do explain that Type 3 is... The way Type 3 works is it pretends to be an injured... um... That was Type 2. Type 2 is the wounded soldier that says, help me, help me. That's Type 2? Mm-hmm. Okay. So so either way, the one that they didn't know, the one that he didn't get to on the machine, on the computer, is a wounded soldier that screams out for help. And they still haven't seen that one, though, because... uh, Which is interesting, because Ross wasn't that one. Right. right. If he was one, which he wasn't, he turned out he was a normal person, but he uh, he got killed, right, by, by Becker. And Becker's like, oops, I thought it was one of them. The children were the type threes. So, interesting. And then the type two is the wounded soldier. And they're saying that, and then what we saw, we see Becker, like, kind of, like you're saying, like at this point, we 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 think Becker's the bad guy, and he turns out to be the villain. And he starts screaming when when they heard him, like when Becker actually gets dangered, he screams, "Help me!" And that's when Ace, you know, he's gonna help him. But then Joe Becker decides to kill Ace. And he starts, he goes in this weird monologue where he's like, I'm my own self, I don't need love, I'm not a human. Yeah, so this is another point where I was like, this is way too close to Blade Runner for me. 
And I was like, I'm over it. So he starts reciting um, poetry. Um, right. Who was it? It wasn't Shakespeare. He didn't say it was Shakespeare. I can't remember who he was supposed to be reciting, but he's he's reciting somebody. Um, and that's exactly what, you know, goes down in Blade Runner as well towards the end of the movie when, um, when the two main people are fighting. And, and you find out that, uh, you know, they start putting some real big philosophical poems on you about life and, and stuff like that. It's just very interesting. Um, but anyways, so, so yeah, so Becker's beaten up on Joe, um, Joe, after, yeah, well, they, so Becker crushed Jefferson because right. Becker, Becker started acting like a type, whatever, where he's laying on the ground. He says, help me. And then he gets yeah. up and he just kills him. Yep. So Becker kills him. Maybe I was completely wrong. I think you're right about the type twos. Um, I think they were the ones that reached their own sentience. But I don't know, man. Like, so they kill him. Or the, the screamer, he dies, and they check his chip, and it's, like, really weird. At this point, Joe just doesn't trust Jessica, or the captain. So he cuts her. Yeah. And he sees that she bleeds. Yeah, he's like, I had to, I had to. And then they fuck. Which is just extra plot yeah, point. <laughs> it's extra plot points. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> and he's like, oh, there's a way to get off this planet. There's a there's an escape pod. And so they go to Alamo. Which Joe can get inside. And oh, only Joe yeah. can get inside. Yep, they called it the new Alamo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is funny. Well, it's a fort, I guess. Remember the Alamo? Remember the Alamo? So... That whole scene is probably one of the best scenes in the movie, though, to me. This really? whole this whole fight breakdown, yeah. Really? Yeah, I actually enjoyed uh, the end of it, because that meant the movie was close to being done. This is the point of the movie where, <laughs> hey, remember me, guys? I'm a bad guy, too. So they lead, us, they lead us to believe, hey, everyone's dead on this planet, except for Joe and this woman. And if you watch the trailer, she's probably a screamer, too. Uh, you see, uh, like the, there's like this big fight with the character from the very beginning. Um, what's his name? Chuck. A uh, Cooper. Chuck. It's yeah, Chuck. So yeah. Chuck appears and he's like, um, I took Cooper's face and now I have Chuck's, but I think I want yours. And the guy falls down and he's like holding off. He's doing the Luke Skywalker hanging thing. And the guy's like about trying to kick him off. Well, and there's these weird lasers around the rocket as well, the spacecraft or whatever, that if you fall right. through, you'll get disintegrated. But there's just four little beams of light. I don't understand exactly how that would work. But, hey, it's know. it's 2078, so we got time to figure that out. We got 50. We got 50 years. <laughs> uh, we got we got Discman still in the future. <laughs> it's He ends up make, falling down and getting vaporized. Yep. And they're they're about to leave and then Jessica Well Joe shows. realizes there's only one chair, one seat in the in the spaceship, right? So him and Jessica are having this uh existential crisis of who is going to be the one to leave. So Joe does the whole well I'll flip this coin that means nothing to anyone. Really? But I had it but I had it in the beginning of the movie and I was looking at it with this eyeglass thing and now it's so important. But heads. He mentions the coins, coin at the campfire too. So he mentions it three times. Yeah, he tries to keep it in context to the viewers, but it's just so stupid. Rule so of three. Um, heads, she goes. Tails, I go. But Jessica shows up after that in front of Jessica. Evil like, Jessica. And that's where my favorite line in the film came in. Yes. Oh wow! I don't even have it here anymore. It was a holy fuck we. We yeah. cry. We, we can smile. Yep. We can cry. We can bleed. We can and we fuck. can fuck. So then there's more fighting, more murder. She, uh, one of the Jess, both Jessicas die. One of them gets burnt by a rocket, rocket fire, and the other one is just all cut up. And he's like, I learned how to love. 
because she's she's the good good screamer who is on the side of her heart. Well, this is the romance part of the movie too, which I feel like that whole section was very forced at the bar scene with Joe and Chuck, where he's asking him about his, you know, it sounds like an ex-wife or someone that he left on Earth, yeah, who just couldn't deal. And now he fell in love with Jessica, and you're supposed to feel bad. But to be honest, I just, I can't. It's it's just not, it's too much, man. It's too much. I don't, I don't give a fuck. <sighs> they, they, they had sex. She's in love with him, or she's lying to him. You know what's really he cool here? On the, the port. Yeah. The, the whatever. You know what's it really cool? Really Joe, Joe, Joe gets away. Okay. Joe, ex- Joe escapes. Survives, but Joe's on the spaceship. And then the teddy bear moves. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, Joey dun, back dun. And the screaming teddy bear. All right. And that, that's the movie in a nutshell. Great movie. 10 out of 10. All right. So I'm going to, I'm just going to take a moment to clarify a few things here. So the film, there is a breakdown of the types. And, and I know I said a couple of ideas that were off the wall. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's the definitive. This is the write-up. So the type that's one right. screamer is the one that burrows in the sand. Those are the trimmer looking things, baby trimmers, okay? There are at least two variants of that type one. They call them type one revised, the one that Hendrickson examines at the beginning of the film and then the reptile-like one encountered at the Neb headquarters an hour into the film. The one that looks like an animal may be a third type, but is never clarified. Then we have the type two, which is said to be a wounded soldier. That's the one that you were talking about. You You had that one correct. Although it should be noted that the only reliable source of this information is Ross, which turns out to be a screamer. So the type three is revealed by the screamer's own tag to be David Edward Deering model. Becker himself may or may not be a type two. And if he is one, he may be an evolved, advanced, revised version that is more capable than the original wounded soldier. It also seems likely that Jessica is a type four. And there's no telling about the teddy bear in the final shot. Perhaps it's a type five, or perhaps it's a four, and Jessica's the five. They don't really clarify any of that information, but that's that's how crazy types are in this movie. Okay, like I, I think I think David was a type two because of the whole help me situation. Good, yeah. I mean, I, I'm I'm totally fair with that. I guess the whole Jessica could be a type five, but the bear could be a four or whatever. Like that all that doesn't matter at this point. There's a sequel. And if there's any information out there in the sequel that explains which type is what. <laughs> is there a sequel? There is a sequel. Screamers there, The Hunting. Screamers The Hunting? Yes. Why? Because Joe got away with a teddy bear, so there has to be a sequel. 2009. Yeah, and it's just a video. It's not. It doesn't look like a full movie. Um, I'm looking at the... Uh... Pictures of the movie looks pretty interesting. Little robot face there. The eye looks like Bloodshot with Vin Diesel. Is Vin Diesel in it? That was Sylvester Stallone. Who are you? T- what? That's not. Yeah, he's not in it. <laughs> no. Not in it. No, he has that movie coming out right now, Bloodshot. Oh yeah, well. With the red eye. So when I look at the screamers, the I hunting poster, it. yeah, cracks me up. All right, so. Anything else you want to talk about this movie? No, I, honestly, now that we've talked about it, I'm over it, and I don't, I don't really need to talk about it ever again. I, I, I'm over it. I have some fun facts and trivia, I guess, that we can go through real quick if we want you know, to. Let's go through the fun facts and trivia. Maybe it'll look at this foul taste out of my mouth that Perfect. just came out. So at the very beginning of the movie, they're playing that strange chessboard-like game, right, in the opening scene. Right. Um, the game is is the game of your. It's a ancient Mesopotamia game. It's still played in Iraq apparently to this day. But I don't know what this day is referring to since this is a moment in time. Um, but I would I would assume they're still playing it today in Iraq. Um, so in the original short story by Philip Dick, the plot takes place on Earth instead of Sirius Sirius Six B, which I think would have been way better for this. And originally, Screamers were developed by American troops hiding in the moon to destroy the Russian army after the Soviet Union had completely wiped out the U.S. So that that's probably why they didn't go with that route. Um, early versions of the screenplay were titled Claw, in reference to the villainous robots, which are all called Claws in the original story. Um, Second Variety is the name of that story, if you want to read it. 
The NEB Command Center was filmed at the Montreal Olympic Stadium at around 1.02. You can see the blue canvas roof in the background. Um, Dan O'Bannon had worked or had been working on the screenplay for Screamers as early as 81. That's a long, long time before this movie was made. The October 10th, 1984 draft credits Michael Campus as a co-writer. It is unknown whether Campus also intended to direct. And yeah, this is Dan O'Bannon's second adaptation of a Philip Dick novel. The first one he did was Total Recall in 1990. That was uh that's probably the most uh, famous one of them. Yeah. I know that would you say Blade Runner was your favorite? I uh it's not Oban, it's Philip Dick's, yeah. My favorite of Philip Dick. Gotcha, gotcha. Um Philip Dick stories. I want to remember the name of the story cuz I feel like I'm not doing it justice. Let's see. He's got a bunch of short stories. Holy cow. Anyways, it's the one that Blade Runner's based off of. Um, let's see. Philip Dick. Sheep. Uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is the name of the story. Written in 1968. Interesting. It is a novel. But yeah, I mean, like, I don't know. This, it's the movie wasn't, I guess, bad. It's fun. It's a, it's a silly action movie, really. Yeah, and just so you know, last trivia item. This is important. Hendrickson's fate is revealed in the sequel, Screamers: The Hunting. Oh, really? It is revealed. So, it's if we, my heart. if we want to know what happened to Hendrickson, we're gonna have to go watch that short. But. Now it's time to move on from this film and talk about some of the things that we've been up to lately. Anything you've been doing that you've been having fun with that you want to talk about or promote? I mean, we could talk about the current pandemic going on, but I feel like we've had enough discussion on that. So everybody just be safe. Take care of yourself. Yeah, please. If you're told to stay inside, stay inside. I'm, I'm quarantined to my house, work from home. I know Clark is also allowed to work from home. Um, all my roommates got a sore throat, so we're being extra careful here, trying not to infect anyone else in case we, we do have a sickness. But um, yeah. I'm not going to, to push any political agenda on that. Just take care of yourself and make sure you're safe. Um, beyond that, I'm not really up to much. I'm more – I, I kind of – I've been playing Final Fantasy VII. I've, I've, I think I've discussed that before, but just trying to – Stay busy. My boxing gym's closed. Um, just making sure I'm not going crazy. Grocery stores but are running know. out of stuff. Trying to make sure you know you yeah. stay up to date on your food store storage and whatnot. Yeah, I got plenty of food, man. I got all the food I need to last a couple weeks, and then I can just go buy produce every every few days. Yeah. Well, if any, since I've been saying this is going to push for more people using delivery systems and hopefully we don't get too crazy. Yeah, that's I mean, that's honestly my hope. It's not it's not looking good out there. Um, but yeah, since I have been home so much, I've been watching a lot of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I've already gotten to season three uh, in probably a week, week and a half of watching. So it's pretty much my background noise while I work now. If I'm not doing other things or watching movies or whatever, it's basically my background noise. But yeah, if you haven't watched Buffy and you like Joss Whedon, watch Buffy. It's pretty good. Joss really understands the inner workings of teenage minds, but has no idea what he's talking about when it comes to college folks, which is why that show fails so miserably later on in the show. Okay. But yeah, watch it. It's fun. I don't really have anything else to talk about. Um... I feel like the biggest thing that we can do here at the end is is I'm not even going to plug our stuff. I'm not even going to say follow us, talk to us, whatever. Like, just stay safe. And, um, you know, we hope to, to see you guys uh, next week for the next episode. It'll be our last space-themed uh, episode. And um, 
Yeah, it's a good one from the 80s. You'll like it. Eat spaghettis. I got nothing, man. Thanks, everybody, for listening to us today. <laughs> uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Why not, my friend? Mein Freund? Mein Freund? Yeah. He was in Leviathan as well. Yeah, he was in many good movies. He's a very good actor, you see, yeah? He just has the same look in all of his films, and he's not very handsome and attractive.